So there are many methods. I'll only talk about this one. And this is something called uh, finding local information about the graph by sampling small subgraphs in it. So the idea is you have this very large graph that we do not, we cannot really see or store or whatever, but we can try to understand how a small subgraph, how many small subgraphs of a particular kind are in this big graph, or we just sample small graphs and see if we can understand some kind of local structure. Okay. So let me, so the key thing that we need to do that is um, to understand what's called the density of the small graph H in the big graph G. Okay. So G is our big graph, H is some small graph. So think of H as like a triangle or a pentagon or something small like that. So then the definition dH of G is that, which is the density of H and G is the following. It's just the probability that a random embedding of the vertices of H into the vertices of G will send edges to edges. Okay, so V of H stands for the vertices of the graph H. V of G is the vertices of the graph G. So what we do is we, we randomly embed the vertices of H into the vertices of G. We have to make sure that edges go to edges and we wanna know um, what is the probability. So for example, here's a, here's a simple example. So I, my big graph is this uh, a pentagon and the small graph H is the edge. And I would like to know the density of edges inside the pentagon. So in this example, we can see exactly what it is. So there are five edges of the pentagon. Um, so five is the number of ways we can embed the small edge into the pentagon. But the pentagon has could, I mean, this graph on five vertices, which is the pentagon, could have had 10 edges, five choose two. So the density of the small edge in the, the small graph H, which is our edge, in the pentagon turns out to be half. Okay, so this is called subgraph density. And these densities actually carry valuable information. So if you fix all graphs H with K nodes, K vertices, then a given graph creates a probability distribution on these small graphs and they carry important information about the properties of the graph, parameters of the graph and so on. So this is the kind of information that's in this book that I showed you before. And um, it's, it's, it's actually valuable information. Here's another thing that people study. So there's something called graph profiles. And this is when we take a, a tuple of densities. So in, this, in my example, I only chose two densities, but you could choose you know, any finite number, usually a small number. So for example, I take the small graph, which is an edge, and another small graph, which is a triangle. And I plot the density of the edge in G and the density of the triangle in G for any graph G as the number of vertices of G goes to infinity. So we look at very, very large graphs and we just try to plot these two numbers. So these are both probabilities. So that means each of these numbers is between zero and one. So if I plot these, this pair of numbers, then I get points that live inside the unit square. Right, so here, that here's the unit square. And as I plot these numbers for very large graphs, what you get is this region that is shaded over here, okay? So the edge density is on the horizontal axis and the triangle density is on the vertical axis and you get this picture. And the picture is actually the closure of all these points that uh, we get by plotting edge density comma triangle density. Okay, so this is a, co a very complicated picture actually. It has uh, some bounding pieces. We'll see later that this piece on the top is a cubic polynomial. And then there are these, then of course there's this flat part, which is fine. But then there are these sort of infinitely many curvy parts. There are actually infinitely many of them and they are rather complicated. And the full structure of this picture, uh, which is called a graph profile, was only understood, you know, like in, in around 2007. So a lot of people have worked on this and now we fully understand this particular picture. But in general, these graph profiles, which are tuples of densities that you can uh, write down for a small set of fixed graphs is, is very complicated. And I believe that no graph profile is known even for three densities. So that's, so this is an example of a graph profile. Okay. So to understand uh, 
density is better, what we're going to do now from, our, from now on is we're going to, I'm going to define a slightly different notion of density, which is called a homomorphism density. And then once I've defined that, I'm going to justify to you that we can just study this type of density instead of the old type of density. And then we'll carry on from there. And, and this density you will see has some very nice properties that makes it actually easy to study. So let me define what a graph homomorphism is, first of all. So if I have a, a, a small graph H and a big graph G, then a graph homomorphism from H to G is just a map. So it's a map from the vertices of H to the vertices of G. So you send every vertex in H to, to a vertex of G. And the only property it needs to have is that if I have an edge in H, then the image of the two vertices, phi i and phi j, they should form an edge in G. So I have to send edges in H to edges in G. That is the, the only condition. But otherwise, I can send the vertices of H into the vertices of G as I like. So the difference from the previous definition is that this is not an embedding. So I'm allowed to send vertices of H to the same vertices of G if I want. So I can have things from the, from the left overlap on the right. It's not an embedding, but you do have to preserve edges, okay? And this little, this number little harm HG is going to count the number of homomorphisms I can have from H to G, okay? So it's some number and the homomorphism density of H and G is defined to be T H G. And it is basically the number of homomorphisms from H to G, which is some number that we have to calculate depending on the H and G that we have, divided by the total number of maps that we could have made of the type phi, okay? So meaning that how many ways can I send the vertices of H into the vertices of G? Well, every vertex of H can, has VG choices. So little VG means the number of vertices in G. So I have VG choices for every vertex in H. So altogether, I have this, X, this quantity down here as the total number of maps phi I could have made if I didn't care about this adjacency preserving property. So this ratio is known as the homomorphism density, okay? So let me do an example again, just to show you the difference from what the previous density was. So previously we calculated the subgraph density, which was the density of edges in the Pentagon. We said it was half, okay? Now, if you calculate homomorphism density, well, let's calculate the denominator first. So this edge has two vertices, so I can send each vertex to any vertex in the pentagon. So first I send one vertex to five possibilities. Then I send the other vertex again to any vertex in the pentagon. I don't really care whether the vertices overlap. So in the bottom, I have 25 possibilities. That is this number. And in the top, I will have 10 possibilities because if you try to send an edge to an edge on the other side, then either you could send it you know, either the edge could be used in one direction or in the other direction. So I have two possibilities in which I can send this edge over here to this one. So I can send it from here to here, or I can send it from here to there. So I have two possibilities. So altogether, 10 is the number of homomorphisms, and that ratio is two-fifth, and you see that these two numbers are different, okay? So they're slightly different concepts, but the important thing is that if you let the number of vertices in your graph go to infinity, then these two densities become asympt they are asymptotically equivalent. So in the long run, they, they are very, very close to each other and the difference goes to zero. So if we are only interested in very large graphs, we can just work with homomorphism densities. We don't really need to work with subgraph densities. And you will see soon why these are very nice. Homomorphism densities are much easier to study, okay? So, because of this property, we're just gonna talk about homomorphism densities from now on. Good. So let me come back to this picture that we had before of the graph profile. So here was the graph profile. So in terms of homomorphism density, you can, you can view this profile uh, as follows. You can also think of this as the tuples of homomorphism densities of an edge in a triangle. But now I don't have to worry about graphs going to infinity. I can just do this for every graph. So if you plot this pair for every graph and take the closure, you get the same picture, okay? So it's a little bit nicer to work with. You don't have to have this th things going to infinity.
And these graph profiles are very useful for lots of purposes. So in particular, they, they provide a language for extremal graph theory. So for example, uh, maybe you've heard of Mantel's theorem. This is an old theorem and extremal graph theory from 1907. And there are two versions of this, and we can see that this theorem you can see in this picture. So for example, the, the usual version is just says that if a graph is triangle free, if there are no triangles in a graph, then the maximum edge density of the graph approaches half as the number of vertices goes to infinity. Okay, so you can't have too many edges in this graph. If, if, there, are, if there are more than a certain number of edges, you're going to be forced to have a triangle. So this is Mantel's theorem. And you can say the same thing in terms of homomorphism density. It's saying that if the edge density exceeds half, then the triangle density has to become positive. And that's exactly what you see here, right? So here's the half point. So if the edge density, which is plotted along this horizontal axis, becomes larger than half, like if it arrives here, then the triangle density is positive. So the triangle density is you know, between these two quantities over here, OK? So this gives you some kind of language for talking about large graphs and talk, talking about densities and so on. These are these profiles, right? So what we wanna talk about is really in, uh, density inequalities, not so much densities. So um, let me explain now how, what, what are these inequalities. So one of the main good uh, properties of homomorphism densities is that it, it, it has a certain multiplicative structure. So if, I'm, if I want to calculate the density of two disjoint graphs, so H and F are two disjoint graphs, I want to calculate its density in G, then that is the same as calculating the density of H and G first and the density of F and G and then multiplying them together. So if you think about the definition, uh, we don't really care how we map the vertices of H and F into the other side. So this, you, you arrive at this multiplicative property. So that means that anytime you see a product of densities, you can actually replace that product with a single density by using a big graph, okay? So this is very convenient because it means that anytime you have an algebraic expression, so when you have products or cubes or whatever, you can just l replace with a single density and therefore you can linearize all the algebraic expressions that you will see. So let's come back to this graph profile. So here's the graph profile again. And in this graph profile, the top part of the profile is bounded by a cubic polynomial inequality. And this, this red inequality is given by this expression over here. So this is due to Kruskal and Katona. And it says that the density of a triangle in G square is always less or equal to the density of an edge cubed. So this is a cubic inequality and the, the part of the profile that we want or the, yeah, the entire profile lies, satisfies this inequality. So this red uh, piece over here is exactly where you get equality and you get this inequality um, as one of the bounding pieces of this profile, okay? So now let's apply this multiplicative property. So if I have triangle G square, then the multiplicative property tells me that that's the same thing as looking at the density of triangle triangle. That means you take two disjoint triangles, calculate the density of that in G, and then density of edge cubed is the same thing as calculating the density of edge, 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 three disjoint edges. Okay, so we have gone from a cubic inequality to just a linear inequality by making the graphs bigger. And now because this is a property that holds for every graph, we usually just write it as triangle triangle is less or equal to edge, 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 okay? So we don't worry about the T and the brackets and everything. We, so normally these inequalities are just written in this sort of pictorial way. And the, it just says triangle square is less or equal to edge cubed. And you're supposed to read it as the density of triangle square is less or equal to density of edge cubed. So these are these inequalities that are true on, for example, in this profile. So this is an inequality that is true for all graphs. Um, here's another one. So here's another inequality that's true on this profile. This is due to Goodman from 1959. It says that triangle density is greater equal to edge density times two times edge density minus one. 
again, if you get rid of all the T and the G and all that, it's just, and do the multiplicative uh, uh, expression, then we see that this is just saying triangle is greater or equal to two times edge square minus edge. Okay, so these are the types of inequalities that I would like to, um, to talk about, and uh, they are what, are, what we call um, graph density inequalities. Okay, there are more inequalities, so I won't, go, uh, I won't say too much about uh, the, the remaining ones. There are many, many inequalities. So here's one due to Erdős that says that the density of a square is always greater or equal to the density of edge to the power four in any graph. And a particular inequality that we will need today is what are called these blakely roy inequalities. So these inequalities were found by several people. It arises in um, matrix theory originally. And it says that if you take a path of length k, so just a, a graph that is a path of length k, then that density is greater or equal to edge to the power k. Okay, so here are some examples. So here is a path of length two, and if that one is greater or equal to edge square. So I put everything on one side. So this is, uh, we call this a cherry. So this is a cherry minus edge square is greater or equal to zero. Here's the, uh, here is the, these blakely roy inequality for k equals three. So if I take a path of length three, then that's greater or equal to edge cubed, okay? So these are called these blakely roy inequalities. And here's another inequality that's actually a conjecture. So this inequality is not known to be true. And this one says, uh, I mean, it's true in some cases. We know the proof for some cases, but in general, it's an open conjecture. So it says that if H is a bipartite graph, then the h minus edge to the power e of h. e of h just means the number of edges in h. So this inequality is known as Sidorenko's inequality or Sidorenko's conjecture. And this one is not uh, proven yet. Okay, it's proven for some cases. So this example for these examples, for instance, are special cases of Sidorenko's conjecture because each of these paths that you write here are actually bipartite graphs. Okay, so these are some examples of density inequalities. Um, so we can try to prove um, some of them. For example, maybe I'll, I'll quickly show you how you prove such an inequality on a very simple example. So for example, if I wanna show that edge minus, uh, sorry, cherry minus uh, edge square is greater or equal to zero, then what we really need to show, if you remember, is this bottom line, right? We need to show that the density of cherry in a graph is always greater or equal to density of edge in the graph to the power two. This is what we need to show, okay? So we need to calculate these quantities. These are densities. So for that, first I need to calculate the number of homomorphisms from cherry into a graph. Well, how many ways can you send this, uh, the vertices of a cherry into the vertices of G? Well, you can take the top vertex and send it to any vertex in G. But once you do that, um, you have to send these vertices that are in the bottom to a vertex that's adjacent to the vertex that you sent the top vertex to, right? So each of these bottom things have uh, degree V many choices. So altogether, there are degree V square choices for the two bottom ones. And then we can vary over all the vertices on the other side because the top one can be sent anywhere. So this homomorphism uh, number is this quantity. How many ways can you send an edge to a graph? Well, as I said before, you can send the edge in two ways into each edges, edge of the graph. So there are two times the number of edges of the graph. And that if from just basic graph theory, you know that's just the sum of the degrees of the vertices in G. Okay, so we have these two expressions. And now we just use Cauchy-Schwarz. And if you just use Cauchy-Schwarz, you will get this expression, and then you plug in all these quantities here, and then you do a little work and you arrive at this inequality, okay? So Cauchy-Schwarz has been one of the big ways in which you prove inequalities for, for these graph densities. And there's in fact a theorem um, <clears throat> that says that any graph density inequality can be proven if you are given infinitely many Cauchy-Schwarz um, possible. I mean, if you can use Cauchy-Schwarz in the limit or if you can use Cauchy-Schwarz infinitely many times, okay? So it, this is a very powerful tool and this is an example of how you prove one of, uh, prove inequalities in, um, in this world of graph densities. Okay, 
But in this talk, I would like to ask whether or talk about whether we can suck, come up with sort of a, a systematic way to prove inequalities by relying on some classical um, classical things from, from algebra, okay? So this brings us to uh, the whole <clears throat> study of non-negative and sums of squares polynomials. So for a, for, for a couple of slides, let, let's forget about graphs and let's just think about polynomials. So if I have a polynomial f, let's say with real coefficients and n variables, so f belongs to r x1 through xn, we say that the, the polynomial is non-negative if it is if it, if it takes non-negative value for every x in Rn. So anytime I plug in an x in Rn, f of x, if it is non-negative, then you say that the whole polynomial is non-negative, okay? So its graph lies entirely above the domain. And we say that the polynomial f is a sum of squares if I can write it as a sum of other polynomials squared. So I can write f as the sum of gi square, where gi's are polynomials that live in the same ring, okay? So sums of squares is sometimes abbreviated as SOS, so I might use that. So if you can write a real polynomial as a sum of squares, then it is hopefully clear that it's non-negative, because if I plug in something on the right-hand side, I'll get something non-negative, and therefore f has to be non-negative. So sums of squares are definitely non-negative, um, but the other direction is not true. So already back in 1888, Hilbert knew that not all non-negative polynomials are sums of squares. So, he asked, so for example, here is an example. This example was constructed much, much later than Hilbert's theorem that not all non-negative polynomials are sums of squares. So here's a picture, for instance, of the Motskin polynomial. So this is a polynomial in two variables. It is non-negative. So here's a graph of the polynomial. The domain is down below. And uh, this polynomial, you can check by brute force that this is not a sum of squares, okay? So there are non-negative polynomials that are sums of squares. They're rather difficult to find if you want com uh, concrete examples, but they exist, okay? So because Hilbert knew that, because he knew that non-negative polynomials are not always sums of squares, he asked the following question in his 17th problem. So in the 1900 list of problems from Hilbert, the 17th one is asking, is, is it true that every non-negative polynomial is a sum of rational functions? So he knew that it's not a sum of squares of polynomials, but the question is whether it can be a sum of squares of rational functions. So that is the same thing as asking, if I take my polynomial f and I multiply it with a sum of squares, so if I'm allowed to multiply f with g, then is it true that the product is a sum of squares? And that is enough to certify the non-negativity of f because if the product is a sum of squares and g is a sum of squares, that means that the product is non-negative and this part is non-negative, so it must be that f is non-negative. So this is an indirect way to show that something is non-negative by multiplying it with the sum of squares and asking if the product is a sum of squares. So this was Hilbert's 17th problem, and the answer is yes, okay? So the answer, the, this problem was solved by uh, Artin in 1927, and you can actually search for these sums of squares using optimization techniques. So there's something called semi-definite programming that allows you to search for these certificates of sums of squares. So this is a very popular thing to do right now. So th this whole semi-definite programming connection is much newer. It's maybe 30, 30, 35 years old. And therefore it's become an exciting sort of uh, resurrection of all of these Hilbert results and the early parts of real algebraic geometry. Okay, so what we would like to do now is we'd like to ask if these graph density inequalities that we just saw before, if they can also be certified by sums of squares. So if you want to show something is non-negative, then for polynomials, it's enough to show it's a sum of squares. So can we do something like that for these graph density inequalities? That is the question, okay? So to do this, we first of all need some analog of the polynomial ring, okay? So we need some algebra in which we can 
think about the, the density expressions as polynomials and then find sums of squares from inside that algebra and so on. So first we need an algebra. So what's the algebra? So we're gonna construct this thing called a gluing algebra. And <clears throat> the gluing algebra is basically this. You take the span over the real numbers of all partially labeled graphs that don't have isolated vertices, okay? So that means you take all possible graphs and you label them in all possible ways. So there are infinitely many of them. There's a lot of them. And you take, you think of these as generators of a vector space and you just take the span of these label graphs or partially labeled graphs over the real numbers, okay? So that means you just make finite linear combinations of these graphs and um, those are the elements of, of, of your vector space. So this is a vector space. But th this has more structure than a vector space. You can actually multiply things inside this uh, vector space. So the way you multiply is if you have a graph like this that is labeled, partially labeled, and you also have another graph like this that's partially labeled, then you just glue them so that the vertices that have the same labels get attached together. Okay, and if you manage to double an edge in the process, you have to remove the, du the doubled edge and just replace back with one edge. So in this example, for instance, if I glue these two, to these two together, then the two gets glued to the two, one gets glued to the one, and I get this graph. So this is the gluing of these two graphs, okay? So there is a multiplication. This is another way to, these are two other graphs that I can glue together to get the same graph, okay? So this vector space is actually an algebra. And it's even uh, graded because, um, it's sort of graded because I can say that I can fix the labels that I, I look at and I can look at all the, the sub-algebras that contain graphs in those labels. And then this whole, the big algebra can be written as a direct sum of all these labeled uh, sub-algebras. Now, an important thing for us is going to be the unlabeled graphs because those are the basic objects. So unlabeled graphs means I'm looking at the subalgebra where they're labeling, where the label set is the empty set. I don't have any labels. And there is a map, there's a linear map that takes you from the whole algebra to the unlabeled part, which is simply to unlabel the graph. Okay, so if I'm given a graph that is partially labeled, then I'm going to, if I put double brackets around it, that just means I remove the labels, okay? So this is called the unlabeling map. It's a linear map that goes from the algebra to this A empty set, which is the part of the algebra that consists of, that's spanned by the unlabeled graphs. Okay, so this is going to play a role. And now we can define what it means to be a sum of squares. So inside this gluing algebra, we're going to call, um, an element A, so element A is an element of our vector space. It's a combination of unlabeled graphs. So A lies in A empty set. So A it's, is a combination of unlabeled graphs. We're gonna say that it's a sum of squares if I can write it like this. That means I can write it as the sum of unlabeled squares. So the AJs come from the algebra. They may be labeled or they're combinations of labeled things. We square them, we unlabel them, sum them, and then it's supposed to equal A. So if this is possible, then we say that A is a sum of squares. That's our definition. So here, let me show you an example. So here, for instance, is an element in A empty set. So this is a combination of unlabeled graphs, okay? So I have a combination of three unlabeled graphs. And on the other side, you see I've written this as a sum of squares, so it is, this combination squared unlabeled plus this square and unlabeled. So you have to check it that this works. Um, and so this is an example of a, a element in the algebra that is unlabeled that is a sum of squares. Okay, so the sum of squares is interesting because we can uh, we can now uh, we can actually certify some inequalities using this. So let me just, I won't go through the steps, but I just wanna show you how you do this. So for example, if I took this edge with label one minus an edge with label two, I square, I unlabeled and divide by half, then because this is a square, this is non-negative. And now if you go through all this gluing construction, you go through all of this construction, what we end up with is just cherry minus edge square, okay? 
So this is another proof that cherry minus ed, ed square is greater equal to zero because I've managed to write this as a square times a positive number, okay? So this is a sum of squares proof of this first blakely roy inequality. Um, and the steps I will skip. Here's another one which I'll also skip. But let's go, go to the problems now that we actually studied. Okay, so there's a long list of uh, open problems about graph homomorphisms uh, by Lovas. And here's problem 17 from, from that list. So this problem asks, is it true that every non-negative graph combination is a sum of squares? And in particular, can the blakely roy inequality be certified by sums of squares? Okay, so that's the question. Is it true that every non-negative graph combination is a sum of squares? And can you certify blakely roy with sums of squares? So remember, blakely roy is these, right? Path, path of length k minus edge to the power k greater equal to zero. This first one we just saw in the previous slide is a sum of squares, but how about this? This one we know is non-negative, but is it true that it is a sum of squares? Okay, so this is, this is the question. Um, there's a second question um, that we also looked at. This is problem 21 in the list. And this is sort of a, the multiplicative version, the rational version. So it's asking, does every non-negative graph combination A have a multiplicative SOS certificate? That means, can you take A and you, can you multiply it with something that looks like one plus a sum of squares? so that the product becomes a sum of squares. So this is like the question that Hilbert asked. It's like the rational version, except that this multiplier has a very, very special form. So B and C are sums of squares. So these were the two questions that he asked. And it turns out there are many gluing algebras. So several people have introduced gluing algebras. There's one by Lovas and Segedi. There's one by Rasborov. There's one by Hatami Noreen. The one I showed you is the one we use in our work. They're all equivalent. So if you can answer this question in any one of the algebras, you can also answer them in all the other algebras. So it's, uh, it's very convenient. Okay, so these are the two questions. And here is an answer that's, uh, that ans the, here's an answer due to Hatami and Noreen from 2011 that answers this, uh, <clears throat> some, of the, some parts of the previous questions. So they proved this very nice result that the determining the validity of a homomorphism density inequality is in general undecidable, okay? So there is no algorithm that's going to be able to decide whether a density expression is non-negative. So that in particular implies that there are non-negative inequalities, that are, there are non-negative expressions that cannot be sums of squares or even rational sums of squares. Um, but on the other hand, there's a kind of contradictory sounding result that says that every non-negative graph combination can be certified by sums of squares up to a small error. So if you're allowed to add a small amount, like an epsilon to the expression, then you can certify it with a sum of squares, but not, um, not the, 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 the original one sometimes, okay? So we don't, we don't know, um, yeah. So there are these two sorts of results um, that tell you something negative and positive. So let me just uh, summarize our results and then I'll say a few words about it before my time is up. So what we proved are the following. So we looked at these blakely roy inequalities and we proved that for odd k, so when k is three or five or seven or whatever, so odd k, if you look at the blakely roy inequality and you even can put a, a scalar in the front if you like, like lambda, it's a real number, this expression cannot be a sum of squares. So we proved that the, the blakely roy inequalities um, are not sums of squares, except for the first one. Uh, well, the first one is not odd, right? The first one that we proved is a sum of squares is for k equal two. So even k's are fine. K, even k's are sums of squares, but the odd ones are not. So this is the first uh, result. And then we also proved that the multiplicative version is also not a sum of squares. So if you take this expression and you multiply it with one plus B, where B is a sum of squares, then the product cannot be a sum of squares. So this answers um, some, this, this gives you, well, it answers the second part of the first Lovas question, but also, it also gives you some very small concrete examples where, 
you get non-negative expressions that are not sums of squares. Um, we also showed that if you look at the Sidorenko conjecture, which if you remember was the case where we needed to show that H minus edge to the power, you know, number of vertices in H is not, is uh, not negative. That's the Sidorenko conjecture. And the smallest case where it's open is for this graph. You take the complete graph, complete bipartite graph on five vertices. So five on one side, five on the side. Remove a cycle of length 10. That's the smallest open case. And we proved that that case is not a sum of squares and its multiplicative version is also not a sum of squares, okay? So these examples give you very small concrete examples where you have non-negative polynomials that are not sums of squares. Um, the Hatami-Noreen results don't give you small examples. They show the existence of um, things that are not sums of squares. And it is also constructive, but they're not small examples. And th these are some very small examples that show you that there's a difference between non-negative uh, graph density in, uh, expressions and sums of squares. OK. So the way to prove this, um, I'll just say one word about it, is to really understand sums of squares. So we want to understand homogeneous sums of squares. We prove some structure results about them. Uh, I don't really want you to read the slide. But you re we looked at, we understood of something about their structure that allowed us to prove that this is not possible. Um, but let me tell you one more result, which I think will explain the Sidorenko result. So if we are going to call a graph, an unlabeled graph, a trivial square, if whenever you can write it as the square of something and then unlabel it, then the something that you can use, the H you can use, is just a fully labeled copy of the graph itself. Okay, so that's what we mean by a trivial square. There's only a trivial way to square and unlabel something to get the original, uh, the original graph. Namely, you take the original graph, you fully label it, square it, unlabel it. That's the only way you can come back to F. So then that's called a trivial square. And paths of length k for k odd, as well as this first Sidorenko case, they're all trivial squares. Okay, so this needs a little proof, but they are trivial squares. And the, the key theorem we proved is that if you have a combination of graphs that looks like lambdas fs, and there is some lambda, some multiply here that's negative, and for all the positive multipliers, the corresponding, uh, the corresponding element fs is a trivial square. If this happens, then this expression cannot be a sum of squares. Okay, so this is, this is the key theorem. So now we can just apply this key theorem to Blakely-Roy, for instance, to see what's happening, right? So this is the Blakely-Roy expression. One of the multipliers has to be negative, which is true. Here's the negative one. And the one that's positive, which is this one, has to be a trivial square. So I just said that the paths of odd length are trivial squares. So then the theorem applies, and it tells you that this is not a sum of squares. Same thing happens here. There's one negative term, and the positive term <clears throat> is a trivial square. Therefore, this is not a sum of squares. So this is, this is the structural result that we used to prove all of these things. Um, and then the, the, the other results are the same. So let me end with just one word. So in a second paper that we wrote this year, we actually extended this study quite a bit. We used something called tropical geometry to understand these profiles. So we basically take the, you know, this, this expression. So you take the logarithm of the profile uh, to the base one over t, take the limit as t goes to zero. So this is a, a standard construction in tropical geometry. And that allows you to change these profiles into much simpler objects. So we proved that all of these, after, after you take this operation, the profile becomes a convex cone. It's a closed convex cone. And that allows you to study binomial inequalities much better because once you take the logarithm of a binomial inequality, it becomes a linear inequality. So in order to study binomial inequalities like Blakely-Roy or Sidorenko and so on, we can pass to this tropical world where we can study linear inequalities on convex cones, which makes things a lot easier. And then we have more results that tell you that, um, that tell you the, give you limitations of these sums of squares techniques.
Okay, that's, I think, everything I wanted to say. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Are there any questions from the participants? You can unmute and ask the speaker directly. Yes, Mukti Acharya. Okay. Hello. Hello, I can hear. Uh, see, there are no questions, but uh, I'm uh, very thankful to you for your today's talk. It is really enlightening for me because uh, you, you, you are operational research and graph theory and you are uh, this uh, sum of squares. Really, I enjoyed your talk and I hope I will uh, see some of the terminology which you have used. It's really a good breakfast for me today. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, I had a question. Uh, the part where you explained the vector space of graphs, what did, yeah. you, what did you mean by uh, our linear combination of those graphs? Can oh, I... so that just means that, um, let me see if I can show. So that just means we're taking a combination um, of graphs. So let me show you an example. It's easier to see an example. Um, let's go back to one of these. Where are they? Yeah, any of these. So for example, yeah, to, let, look at this one, right? So this is the, okay, these are all unlabeled graphs. So this, the star, this, this is another graph, this is another graph. And all we're doing is we're making a real linear combination. So two times this graph plus one times this graph minus two times that graph. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, so, thanks. So elements in the algebra look like this. They also look like this. You can partially label some of the graphs. So this is another element in the algebra. It's in the vector space. This is another one. But the important thing about the vector space is that you can also multiply inside that vector space. So it's an algebra. It's not just a vector space. Okay, thanks. Yes. Okay, if there are uh, no other questions, let us thank the speaker again. And uh, we now break and uh, we assemble at 10.45 for the invited tech, invited talks held in two uh, parallel links. Shall join at 10.45. Thank you, Rega. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>